Adult students, older beginner and later beginner students, you're here on C major before the show. This is the keyboard situation, playing by chords and by color, part five. Adult students, older beginner and later beginner students, you're here on C major before the show. Thank you so much for being with me today. We are starting today's show with Play Piano by Chords and by Color, Part 5, with a focus on minor chords today and how to chord a C major scale. So for the next couple of hours, we're going to talk about how to play a minor chord using chords that you already know. We'll talk a little bit in terms of color today, but mainly the white and black key relationships with some mention of sharps and flats as needed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll start off first with today's lesson talking about chords you already know. By the way, we are making some changes over here at C Major before the show. We want to have the show serve as a gateway to music making for adults. We want to motivate you to learn how to write music down. I'm not trying to teach you to play the piano or play a certain genre. I like to think of myself as an advocate of music literacy. So if you are at a piano and you look down at your hands, you should know where you are, what you're doing, where the music is going next, and how to write what you're doing on paper so that you can communicate with others in a clear way. That's it. It really doesn't get any simpler than that or any more complex than that here on this podcast. I'm excited about today. We are changing the format of each episode going forward in a way that I can describe what I'm going to talk about. Talk about it, talk about something else briefly, and then tell you what I talked about. Don't worry, we'll still do some shout outs somewhere in the middle, but the most important thing I want to focus on is if you're out there running, jogging, exercising, driving, commuting to work, listening just to have some background noise on, whatever the case may be, I'll be live with you here week after week. I've been busy spelling out chords for you in the past. Now I'm going to treat you even better this time because I feel that if you follow the podcast, you are now ready to talk in less baby terms. This is not a baby podcast. Find that A chord that we talked about. Find that E chord that we talked about. It's now time to make these and your other major chords minor. Think of this as your chord workout. You're getting stronger and stronger as you work on these chords yourself. For the colors, check out C Major Before the Show on Facebook. All of the chords are in my news feed over there. I'm sending you there because I want you to see it all for yourself. Let's warm up now by letter names only today. Give me a C chord. Spelled C E G. Give me an F chord. Spelled F A C. Give me a G chord. Spelled G, B, D. Give me a D chord. Spelled D, F sharp, A. Give 
give me an E chord spelled E G sharp B give me an A chord spelled A C sharp E These are all major chords that you know. Now it's time to make them minor. I'm going to say them by letter names. Here we go. Play a C minor chord. C, E flat, G. Play an F minor chord. F, A flat, C. Play a G minor chord. G, B flat, D. Play a D minor chord, D, F, A. Play an E minor chord, E, G, B. Play an A minor chord, A, C, E. And let me say this to you with love and kindness. It's said as minor, like mine, or, and not minus, like Linus. By the way, I'll post pictures with my hand model for you over at the C Major Before the Show page on Facebook. Now we can form a drill. I want you to begin every day that you practice with going over these chords in this order. And prepare to spend five to six minutes a day on this drill. Please remember to go only as fast as you can. Listen to each chord. You can always challenge yourself by going faster. You may use any fingering that you wish. When I teach at the lesson studio, of course, I give my students guidance on hand positioning and fingering. Sometimes they follow it and sometimes they choose what is comfortable for them. You want to maintain control over your own playing and your own motion at all times. I would say try to play this drill six times if you can. That's my recommendation, but I'll leave it up to you to decide if you can play the drill six or seven times in a short practice period. Here we go. Play it like you feel it. C. C minor, C, F, F minor, F, G, G minor, G, D, D minor, D, E, E minor, E, A, A minor, A. How did you do? 
Remember, try to repeat this drill six or seven times. This will become one way that you can warm up on triads at the piano. Now we're going to move into something that I've wanted to teach you for a while. We're in our over 30th episode. This is the longest episode today, and it will get longer. Once September rolls around, we are looking to keep you here for three hours. The third hour will be spent helping you with your homework assignment. That will start up in September. Let's move on now into the C major scale played as chords. This should be fun. You'll play them all as white keys. You may play them with both hands or with your right hand or with your left hand alone. I'll spell out each triad. C, E, G. D, F, A. E, G, B. F, A, C. G, B, D. A, C, E. B, D, F. C, E, G. Remember the episode when we played blues chords? You learned that the three most important chords used in blues, jazz, and rock are built on the first, fourth, and fifth steps of the scale. By the way, on a personal note, I think I might have found a jazz teacher for myself. I'm excited. I'll keep you posted. Chord symbols indicate a major chord unless otherwise noted. So if I call out C, F, G, that means to play a C major chord, F major chord, and G major chord. We'll talk more about chords in the future. For now, I want to give you a couple of progressions to practice. A chord progression is an organized series of changing chords. Watch out for the ch 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 changes. Ch ch changes. Here we go. Play it like you want to. A minor. A minor. G. G. F. F, E, E, A minor, A minor, G, G, F, E, A minor, A minor. How did you do? I want you to know that I will repeat this whole 30-minute segment again. And again, in today's episode. Do you remember that we spoke about comping in an earlier episode? Keyboard players usually comp when accompanying or backing up a solo, instrumentalist, or singer. It's common for professionals to play the chord symbols using notated rhythms, indicated with note heads, or to improvise the rhythms, notated with slashes. In the future, we'll talk more about Roman numerals so that I can say we're going to play a progression that uses 1, 6, 2, 5, and you'll know that I mean C major, A minor, D minor, and C major for the chord changes. We haven't talked about rhythmic notation yet, but if you want to know more about notation, join me over at the C major radio show. Here we go. Play it like you feel it. C. C, A minor, A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, E minor, E minor, A minor, A minor, G, G. C, C, A minor, A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, C, C, A minor, A minor, D minor, G, C. (laughs) 
How did you do? Fine, I hope. We're in a roll. Let's do one more progression. Try to play these chords with feeling and expression if you can. Here we go. Play it with feeling and expression. C, 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 C. D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor. C, 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 C. F, F, E minor, E minor. D minor, D minor, E minor, E minor. F, F minor, E minor, E minor. D, D. G, G. C, 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 C. D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor. C, 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 C. How did that one go for you? I'm excited for you. We don't really have one set textbook assigned to this podcast, but I want to read from a book that I currently use with my students. It's about triads and chords. It says, What distinguishes Western music more than anything else from other musical traditions is that it is made up of mixtures of simultaneous sounds of different pitch, known as harmony. In comparison with other music, Other music may have more complex rhythmic and melodic expression. I won't go into the cultures that are mentioned here, but you can use your imagination. I have a musician friend that travels all over the world, and he talks about this. A triad consists of three notes. These three are the notes on which the triad is based also known as the root, plus the third, and the fifth above it. As we have seen today in the case of the C major scale, triads can be built on each degree of the major and minor scales. They take their names from the degrees of the scale on which they are based. The triad on the tonic, key note, is the tonic triad. The triad on the dominant is the dominant triad, and so on. As a shorthand device, they are also referred to by Roman numerals. One, two, three, four, five, six, for tonic, supertonic, median, etc. The triads on 1, 4, and 5 are known as the primary triads because the chords derived from them have a particular importance. Triads are classified as major, minor, augmented, or diminished. Skipping ahead in this book, a triad is the simplest type of chord. The word chord itself does not have a very precise meaning. It could be defined as three or more notes sounded together, but there is no limit to the number of notes in a chord. Apart from the practical considerations of the number of fingers you can use to play the chords. Over several centuries, Western music gradually evolved an elaborate system of chords and their relationship to each other. Chords are especially popular in popular music, as you'll see. What is important about chords is the way they lead to and away from each other. They are not isolated events. If this topic is interesting to you and you'd like to get into the language of chords, please feel free to contact me offline. I'll let you know where you can find this resource. It talks about chords, 
chord notation and jazz, etc. Figured bass and chord layouts, to name a few topics. Now, as we come to the end of this segment, I'd like to offer you some practical tips. These tips come from the book entitled Learning a Musical Instrument. If you have begun to take some lessons on the piano or if you've been playing the chords that we discussed, it's time to explore some ideas to help you maintain your progress. It may at times feel like two steps forward and one step backwards. That's to be expected. You may live in the greater New York City area. I ran into an adult student over the weekend. He is studying a woodwind instrument for the first time. He sounded a little down. I tried to cheer him up by reminding him that he is multitasking. He's trying to master a number of new skills while balancing a job, a family, living in a busy area near the George Washington Bridge. He complained that his progress was slower than he wished it to be. I let him know that it's normal to feel this way. He looked so defeated. But I reminded him that he is making progress. Another adult student came to me with a similar concern. She's doing great in her lessons, but she felt really bummed out because she wants to play music that she hears on YouTube by her favorite artist. Her teacher is a classically trained teacher, so the teacher doesn't always know the songs that the student wishes to learn. I encouraged the student to hang in there and reminded her that it takes time to see the progress you wish to see. Many adults look forward to practicing a musical instrument because they are doing what they dreamed of doing. They are playing the music they really want to play. They know that practice is really the key to success. They have a sense of quote-unquote me time when they practice, especially after a hard day of work. Practicing can relieve tension that builds up after a hard day at work. You may feel that your practice time is repetitive. You may feel isolated. You may feel that it is concentrated on the difficult parts only. Just remember that you are trying to self-improve your playing over time. It's not going to happen all in one day. Finding the right time to practice can be a little tricky. I once had a customer when I worked in music retail who showed me his roll-up keyboard that he took to work with him. His wife was totally against his idea to play a music instrument. She would bar him from purchasing instruments and buying equipment. He would sneak and do it anyway. Practicing was what he loved, and he found a way to keep himself sharp by practicing at work during his breaks. If you do have family support at home, you may find time to practice in the mornings before you take off for work. That's a tough one, too. Anyone who lives in New York knows that the commute to work is a hectic one. It doesn't matter where you live in New York City. It's all about money, and it's all about work. You may find yourself focused so intently on your work and getting to work on time that it may feel impossible to find adequate time to practice. As with any form of learning, little and often is usually best in these cases, even if it is for a few minutes at a time. When you come home from work, you may feel too tired to practice. You're not getting any younger, and you may feel that your dreams of learning to play a musical instrument are slipping away. We posted a poll over a C major before the show. Do you believe that practice makes perfect or practice makes better? 
The gaps between practicing give your brain and muscle memory time to assimilate and consolidate what you're learning. Making that time in between practice is all the more important. This aspect of learning away from the instrument mirrors what has been developed in sports training. It's possible to practice in your mind by going over the muscle movements. The familiar saying, practice makes perfect, very easily becomes practice makes better. And if we do make something better, we need to make sure it's absolutely accurate. Now, I'm going to say something that some people may not like, especially online teachers. I'm an online and an offline teacher myself. Please don't get mad at me. Don't beat me up. Don't blame me. I'm just a messenger. Quote, This is where the weekly lesson with your teacher beats online learning and other forms of self-tuition as the effective teacher can quickly put an end to a simple error in posture, breathing, or hand movement and save much wasted time later on. As much as I love doing this podcast and helping my friends online, I will have to say the author has a point. Let me give you some examples of what an in-person teacher might do versus a virtual 24-7 online one. In-person teachers have a deeper influence on the personal development of a student. Piano study can be a vehicle for fostering valuable life and work skills that lie outside the realm of music skills. In-person teachers have the opportunity to nurture confidence Curiosity, discipline, patience, self-esteem, sensitivity to nuance, understanding how process relates to product and work habits. Your attitude and your character come into play when you're learning a musical instrument. We'll talk about the attitude part in the future. The in-person piano teacher engages the student with a sense of adventure and discovery and reward. In-person piano teachers give purpose and direction in the lessons along with hard work. Lots and lots of hard work. Discipline can be rewarding when one's attention and senses are actively engaged. This blurring between work and fun is precisely intended as it leads to deep learning, effective practice habits, and a healthy work ethic. So one advantage of working in person with a teacher is that the teacher can intervene appropriately in real time when a skill falls apart or the student loses motivation. One simple thing that I do that motivates my students week after week, I give stickers. It may seem like this trivial thing, but it works. I give stickers to my adult students, and they love it. They acknowledge it. They look forward to it. They make requests for them. And I suppose it may be possible to give virtual sticker rewards, too, through an app or something. It can be argued that teachers working via Skype and other online methods can do the same. But you need to know how to do things correctly at all times. Let's take sitting at the piano properly. I talk about this frequently with all of my students. Ask yourself, do you know where to sit on a piano bench? First of all, do you have a piano bench? Or a stool? Are you sitting tall on the bench? Are you measuring your distance from the fall board? It's important to use correct posture. Are you sitting at the appropriate seating distance? Are your arms level with the keyboard? 
sitting at the piano is not like sitting on a chair at home. If you are taking lessons online and at home, check with your instructor to make sure that you are not slouching or scrunching. I once went to a home for in-home piano lessons only to be offered a lounge seat, a lawn chair, one for myself and one for the student. I promise I am not trying to be preachy here, but it's important to demonstrate proper seating and explain proper posture. We'll talk more about this in an upcoming episode. For now, let me just repeat everything I've said to you so far before launching into a separate segment. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll continue in this next half with today's lesson, reiterated, talking about chords you already know. By the way, we're making changes over here at C Major before the show. We want to have the show serve as a gateway to music making for adults. We want to motivate you how to learn music and how to write music down. I'm not trying to teach you to play the piano or play a certain genre. I like to think of myself as an advocate of music literacy. So if you are at the, a piano and you look down at your hands, you should know where you are, what you're doing, and where the music is going next, and how to write what you're doing on paper so that you can communicate with others in a clear way. That's it. It really doesn't get any simpler or more complex than that here on this podcast. I'm excited about today. We're changing the format of each episode going forward in a way that I can describe what I'm going to talk about, talk about it, talk about something else briefly, and then let you know what I talked about. Don't worry, we'll still do shout out somewhere in the middle, but the most important thing I want to focus on is if you're out there running, jogging, exercising, driving, commuting to work, listening just to have some background noise on, cleaning your house, whatever the case may be, I'll be live with you week after week. I've been busy spelling out chords for you in the past. Now, I'm going to treat you even better. This time, I feel like if you follow the podcast, you're ready now to talk in less baby terms. This is not a baby podcast. Go ahead and find that A chord that we talked about. Find that E chord that we talked about. It's now time to make these and your other major chords minor. That's right. That's right. Think of this as your chord workout. You're getting stronger and stronger as you work on these chords yourself. For the colors, check out C Major Before the Show on Facebook. All the chords are in my news feed over there. I'm sending you there because I want you to see it all for yourself. Let's warm up by letter names only today. Give me a C chord. Spell C-E-G. Give me an F chord, spelled F-A-C. Give me a G chord, spelled G-B-D. Give me a D chord, spelled D-F-sharp-A. Give me an E chord, spelled E, G sharp, B. Give 
Give me an A chord spelled A, C sharp, E. Now these are all major chords that you know. It's time to make them minor. I'll call them out by letter names. Here we go. Play a C minor chord. C, E flat, G. Play an F minor chord. F, A flat, C. Play a G minor chord. G, B flat, D. Play a D minor chord. D, F, A. Play an E minor chord. E, G, B. Play an A minor chord. A, C, E. And let me say this to you with love and kindness. It's said as minor like minor and not minus like linus if you need a chord chart please see me offline i can steer you to one to pick up for yourself or order for yourself that is if you want my free advice by the way i have posted pictures with my hand model for you over at c major before the show check out that page on facebook I'll be right back. Okay, now we're going to form that drill. We did this in the first part of today's show, and here I am repeating it again because I really want you to get it. And I want you to begin every day that you practice with going over these chords in this order. So please prepare to spend five to six minutes a day on this drill. Please remember to go only as fast as you can. Listen to each chord. You can always challenge yourself by going faster. You may use any fingering that you wish. When I teach at the lesson studio, of course, I give my students guidance on hand positioning and fingering. Sometimes they follow it, and sometimes they choose what is comfortable for them. You want to maintain control over your own playing and your own motion at all times. I would say try to play this drill six times if you can. That's my recommendation, but I'll leave it to you to decide if you can play the drill six or seven times in a short practice period. So here we go. Play it like you feel it. C, C minor, C. F, F minor, F. G, G minor, G. D, D minor, D. E, E minor, E, A, A minor, A. How did you do? Did I go too fast for you? I'm sorry. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do your favor. I'm going to post this over on my blog. So please see me over at cmajorsclassroom.wordpress.com. I'll post it there so you can practice your drill during the week. Or feel free to rewind the podcast and listen at your leisure as you download C Major Before the Show on demand. So getting back to the drill, remember, try to repeat this drill six or seven times. This will become one way that you warm up on triads at the piano. 
Now we're going to move into something that I've wanted to teach you for a while. We're in our over 30th episode. And this is the longest episode today. And it will get longer. Once September rolls around, we are looking to keep you here for three hours. The third hour will be spent helping you with your homework assignment. That will start up in September. Let's move on now into the C major scale played as chords. This should be fun. You'll play them all as white keys. You may play them with both hands or with your right hand or with your left hand alone. I'll spell out each triad. Here we go. C, E, G. Go up to D, F, A. Go up to E, G, B. Go up to F, A, C. Go up to G, B, D. Up to A, C, E. Up to B, D, F. Up to C, E, G. And you've probably done this on the piano a number of times. You just didn't realize that's what you were doing. Remember that episode when we played blues chords? You learned that the three most important chords used in blues, jazz, and rock are built on the first, fourth, and fifth steps of the scale. By the way, on a personal note, I think I might have found a jazz teacher for myself. Thank you very much. I'm excited. And I will keep you all posted. It should be fun. I've been told over the years that I should know how to play some jazz and blues, even though I'm classically trained. And the interesting thing is my teacher wants to learn to play classical, so we're going to do a friendly exchange. Chord symbols indicate a major chord unless otherwise noted. So if I call out C, F, and G, that means to play a C major chord, F major chord, and G major chord. We'll talk more about blues in the future. For now, I want to give you a couple of progressions to practice. A chord progression is an organized series of changing chords. Watch out for the ch 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 changes. Ch ch changes. Here we go. Play it like you want to. A minor, A minor, G, G, F, F. E, E, A minor, A minor, G, G, F, E, A minor, A minor. How did you do? Remember that I will repeat this whole segment one last time in this episode. I realize that we live in a world of so many distractions. I just read something online this morning where another piano teacher was talking about that. She was saying how her students only have like 10 minutes in their attention span and how they're always on their mobile devices and it's very difficult for her to get them to pay attention for 30 minutes. So she does a lot of praying and she does a lot of gentle talking to her students and just getting to the understand the value of listening, listening for that still, small voice. It's almost impossible to pay attention for any length of time because you're constantly being interrupted. A phone call, a text, an email alert, a news announcement, a meeting, a family thing. The list goes on. I get it. I live this style of life myself. There's always some noise around. Hardly ever a quiet moment. If you are unable to continue listening to me, just know that I'll come back near the end of the podcast and you can find your way and pick up where you left off. You'll recognize what I've said from the script and there will be some variations here and there, but you'll hear me reiterate the point of today's episode. I hope this helps. Do you remember that we spoke about comping in an earlier episode? Keyboard players usually comp when accompanying or backing up a solo instrumentalist or singer. It's common for professionals to play the chord symbols using notated rhythms, indicated with note heads, 
or to improvise the rhythms notated using slashes. In the future, we'll talk more about Roman numerals so that I can say we're going to play a progression that uses 1, 6, 2, 5, and you'll know that I mean C major, A minor, D minor, and G major for the chord changes. We haven't talked about rhythmic notation yet, but if you want to know more about notation, just see me over at the C major radio show. Okay, here we go. This is our next progression, and I want you to play it like you feel it and to have fun with it. So I'm going to call out the chord names, and I'm going to try to go a little bit slower than I did in the first segment. But I still want to go at a certain pace. So here we go. C, C, A minor. A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, E minor, E minor, A minor, A minor, G, G, C, C, A minor, A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, C, C, A minor, A minor, D minor, G, C. How did you do? Fine, I hope. We're on a roll. Let's just do one more progression. Try to play these chords with feeling and expression if you can. Here we go. Play it with feeling and expression. C, 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 C. That's eight Cs. D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor. That's four D minors. C, 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 C. That's four C's. F, F, E minor, E minor. That's two F's and two E minor chords. D minor, D minor, E minor, E minor. That's two D minor chords and two E minor chords. Sometimes my students like to count the chords. Okay, now we're going to finish the progression. F, F minor, E minor, E minor. D. D, G, G, C, 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 D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor, C, 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 C. How did that one go for you? Was it difficult? If so, I'm sorry, but I'm excited for you. We don't really have one set textbook assigned to this podcast, but I'm going to read something from from a book that I currently use with my students. It's about triads and chords. And it says, What distinguishes Western music more than anything else from other musical traditions is that it is made up of mixtures of simultaneous sounds of different pitch, known as harmony. In comparison with other music, other music may have more complex rhythmic and melodic expression. I won't go into the cultures that are mentioned here, but you can use your imagination. Over the weekend, I had a chance to play music from a different culture. It was really, really interesting. So I can identify with what they're saying here. I also have a musician friend that travels all over the world, and he talks about this. He talks about how other cultures make music and how it's influenced his own playing. 
A triad consists of three notes. These three are the notes on which the triad is based, also known as the root plus the third and the fifth above it. As we have seen today in the case of the C major scale, triads can be built on each degree of the major and minor scales. They take their names from the degrees of the scale on which they are based. The triad on the tonic key note is the tonic triad. The triad on the dominant is the dominant triad, and so on. As a shorthand device, they are also fe- referred to by Roman numerals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for tonic, supertonic, and median, etc. The triads on 1, 4, and 5 are known as the primary triads because the chords derived from them have a particular importance. Triads are classified as major, minor, augmented, or diminished. Skipping ahead in this book, a triad is the simplest type of chord. The word chord itself does not have a very precise meaning. It could be defined as three or more notes sounded together, but there is no limit to the number of notes in a chord, apart from the practical considerations of the number of fingers you can use to play the chords. Over several centuries, Western music gradually evolved an elaborate system of chords and their relationship to each other. Chords are especially popular in popular music, as you'll see. What is important about chords is the way they lead to and away from each other. They are not isolated events. If this topic is interesting to you and you'd like to get into the language of chords, please feel free to contact me offline. I'll let you know where you can find this resource. It talks about chords, chord notation and jazz, etc., figured bass, and chord layouts, to name a few topics. Now, as we come to the end of this segment, I'd like to offer you some practical tips. These tips come from the book entitled Learning a Musical Instrument. This book was written for adults. If you have begun to take some lessons on the piano or if you've been playing the chords that we've discussed, it's time to explore some ideas to help you maintain your good progress. It may at times feel like two steps forward and one step backwards. That's to be expected. You may live in the greater New York City area. I ran into an adult student over the weekend. He is studying a woodwind instrument for the first time. For the first time, He sounded a little down. I tried to cheer him up by reminding him that he is multitasking. He's trying to master a number of new skills while balancing a job, a family, living in a busy area near the bridge. He complained that his progress was slower than he wished it to be. I let him know that it's normal to feel this way. He looked so defeated. But I reminded him that he is making progress. Another adult student came to me with a similar concern. She's doing great in her lessons, but she felt really bummed out because she wants to play the music that she hears on YouTube by her favorite artist. Her teacher is a classically trained teacher, so the teacher doesn't always know the pop and bop songs that the student wishes to learn. I encourage the students to hang in there and remind her that it takes time to see the progress you wish to see. Many adults look forward to practicing a musical instrument because they are doing what they dreamed of doing. They are playing the music they really want to play. They know that practice is really the key to success. They have a sense of me time when they practice, especially after a hard day of work. Practicing can relieve tension that builds up after a hard day at work. You may feel that your practice time is repetitive. You may feel isolated. You may feel that it is concentrated only on the difficult parts. Just remember that you are trying to self-improve your playing over time. It's not going to happen all in one day. Finding the right time to practice can be a little tricky. I once had a customer when I worked in music retail. 
He was so passionate about playing the piano. He showed me his roll-up keyboard that he took to work with him. His wife was totally against his idea to play a music instrument. She would bar him from purchasing instruments and buying equipment. He would sneak and do it anyway. Practicing was what he loved, and he found a way to keep himself sharp by practicing at work during his breaks. If you are lucky enough to have family support at home, you may find time to practice in the mornings before you take off of work. That's a tough one, too. Anyone who lives in New York knows that the commute to work is a hectic one. It doesn't matter where you live in New York. It's all about money, and it's all about work. As with any form of learning, little and often is usually best in these cases, even if for a few minutes at a time. By the way, we posted a poll over at C Major before the show. Did you see it? The question is, do you believe that practice makes perfect or practice makes better? You see, the gaps between practicing give your brain and muscle memory time to assimilate and consolidate what you are learning, making that time between practice all the more important. This aspect of learning away from the instrument mirrors what has been developed in sports training. The old adage, practice makes perfect, very easily becomes practice makes permanent. And if we do something permanent, we need to be sure it's absolutely right. Now, I'm going to say something that some people may not like, especially online teachers. Don't blame me, I'm just a messenger. And the quote says, this is where the weekly lesson with your teacher beats online learning and other forms of self-tuition as the effective teacher in person can quickly put a simple error in posture, breathing, or hand movement right and save so much wasted time later on. As much as I love doing this podcast and helping my friends online, I would have to say that the author has a point. Let me give you some examples of what an in-person teacher might do versus a virtual one. Teachers have a deep influence on the personal development of a student. Piano study can be a vehicle for fostering valuable life and work skills that lie outside the realm of music skills. Teachers have the opportunity to nurture confidence, curiosity, discipline, patience, self-esteem, sensitivity to nuance, understanding how process relates to product and work habits. Your attitude and your character come into play. We'll talk about the attitude part in a moment, but the in-person piano teacher engages the student with a sense of adventure and discovery. In person, piano teachers give purpose and direction in the lessons along with hard work, lots and lots of hard work. Discipline can be rewarding when one's attention and senses are actively engaged. This blurring between work and fun is precisely intended as it leads to deep learning, effective practice habits, and a healthy work ethic. So one advantage of working in person with a teacher is that the teacher can intervene appropriately in real time when a skill falters or motivation flags. It can be argued that teachers working via Skype and online can do the same but you need to know how to do things correctly at all times let's take sitting at the piano properly I I talk about this frequently with my students and then ask yourself if you know where to sit on a piano bench have you had that discussion with your teacher first of all do you have a piano bench or a stool Are you sitting tall on the bench? Are you measuring your distance from the fall board? What's the fall board, you say? Ask your teacher. 
it's important to use correct posture. Are you sitting at the appropriate seating distance? Are your arms level with the keyboard? And let me tell you that sitting at the piano is not like sitting on a chair at home. You're not sitting in your comfy chair like you're sitting at home when you play the piano. And if you are, you need to make that correction. And then ask your teacher, ask your online teacher if he or she can make a recommendation on where to get the best chair to practice when you're sitting in front of that computer learning how to play the piano. When you're learning to play the piano, self-teaching yourself at home, what should you be sitting on? What's the height you should be sitting at? Should your arms be level with your keyboard? Things like that you need to know so you don't run into any problems with your posture, run into any problems with your back, run into any pain. You should not have any discomfort at all when you're learning to play the piano. Talk to your music professional. At the very least, get yourself to a retail store. Talk with a retail professional and ask their opinion on what they can order for you or find for you on the retail floor so that you are comfortable when you're taking lessons online and at home. Check with your instructor to make sure that you are not slouching or scrunching. You know, I once went to a home for in-home piano lessons only to be offered a lounge seat, like the one they sit on at the beach, and a lawn chair, like the one you sit on when you're sitting outside on the porch. One was for myself and one was for the student. And I promise you, I'm not trying to be preachy here, but it's important. It's important to demonstrate proper seating and explain proper posture. We'll talk about this a little bit more in an upcoming episode. And we'll also talk about the attitude part. I said we would talk about that in a moment, but basically it's just good to have a good attitude when you're learning to play a musical instrument and not give up and have the type of teacher who will encourage you and keep it positive. So for now, let me just let you know that I've spent time repeating everything I've said to you so far before going into this next part. And I'm also going to talk to you a little bit more about what's coming up in the next episode here on C Major Before the Show. Please check our Facebook page for the posting of the pictures of chords and hand placement. Friends, let me say this to you, that sometimes when you have the best of intentions, there's always someone who misunderstands. So I just, I just like to say that sometimes good intentions are misunderstood. A person's intention to do good is even ridiculed by those who should know better. In my heart of hearts, I don't mean any harm by doing student shout outs, but I'm bringing these to a halt. Sometimes people do have misunderstandings. In fact, I wrote a piano song called Misunderstandings. I haven't published it yet. I haven't recorded it yet either. But these, th- these things happen. When someone has a failure to understand something correctly, what do you do? With great sadness, I am announcing that this is our last week of student shoutouts until I hear from you that you want these to continue. So... I'm a little sad about it, taking a deep breath here, but I'll continue to do shout-outs from time to time, but they just may not be student shout-outs. Back in a moment.
It is the end of August. I can't believe it's the end of August. PSL season is here. I will feature some pumpkin theme effects to go along with the fall and the leaf rakers out there. So pumpkin spice is back this week. Today, as a matter of fact, I'm so excited. You'll have to forgive me. I used to be a barista in my other life. I loved being a barista. I love coffee culture. I connected with so many people over coffee and music. But anyway, happy PSL season and let the pumpkin spice begin. So that's some of my Halloween effects that you'll be hearing here on the show. Uh, I want you to tune in to the next C Major before the show. C Major's classroom episode, we're going to talk more about chords, and I'm going to show you how to play more major chords, including D flat, E flat, A flat, G flat, B flat, and B. That's next time. That's right. Get in touch with me on social media. C Major's Twitter is back in action. I am rebuilding my Twitter page. So if you're more comfortable being on Twitter with me than on Facebook, see me there for daily tweets. I'm coming back with a renewed focus. As a renewed focus. I'm coming back with a renewed focus. As a matter of fact, I want to tweet more with a focus on retweets only. So you'll see me follow someone and then just retweet. Some people don't like that, but if I tell you ahead of time, you know to look for that. When people study music, they learn much more than simply how to sing or play an instrument. Most of us can't become professional musicians as adults. But the time spent on music adds up to much more than just a hobby. Musicians gain a number of soft skills that are helpful in any type of career, as opposed to hard skills, which consist of specific knowledge and skills needed for a given job. Soft skills are equally important abilities that allow you to interact well with others and complete work successfully, and they're in high demand. Having soft skills makes you more competitive in the job market and increases your chances of success in any position, even if you're self-employed. Whether you end up in a music-related career or not, you will be more prepared to tackle future employment challenges by having these soft skills learned through music. I'm not sure who I'm talking to today on this podcast. But I'll keep my fingers crossed that you have these soft skills. And I will knock on wood that you begin to locate a music teacher today so that you can begin to work on them. So making music not only makes you smarter, as the claim goes for young students, studying music as an adult also makes you a valued worker. You may have many other skills, but without confidence, it's difficult to apply them to the best of your ability. The pride and sense of accomplishment that come from learning how to play an instrument, mastering a piece of music, and performing it successfully builds a music student's confidence. It also teaches them how to feel that they have achieved something through steady work. Overcoming any trepidation about performing in front of others is another boon in the professional world. Whether you're feeling nervous about a job interview or meeting or having stage fright about giving a presentation in front of a group of people, gaining experience with this as a young person can help you produce 
a confident and capable adult. And if you're an adult already, do you want to learn skills that will help you in your career? Consider taking music lessons today to build your confidence. Music students learn how to deal with criticism. Constructive criticism from an instructor is a vital part of the learning process, and a music student needs someone with experience to help identify areas that need work and offer strategies for improvement. It's no different in the workplace. Employees will receive feedback from their supervisors and others, and they must know how to accept criticism gracefully and learn to adapt their work accordingly. Musicians may also experience criticism that is less constructive and the same may be true in the workplace. This is unfortunate, but having experience dealing with that as a music student can help you mentally prepare for it on the job and be open to feedback. The ability to collaborate well with your team and other colleagues is a critical skill in the business world. People have different personalities and work styles, but they all most work together. Musical ensembles of any size must function as a team, overcoming personal differences to produce good work. Cultivating a sense of responsibility towards your team helps you feel more determined to overcome differences and carry your own part for the team as a whole through teamwork. Good communication skills are extremely valuable and can mean the difference between success and failure. Musicians learn how to use verbal and nonverbal cues to communicate with one another while rehearsing and performing. They learn how to gauge audience reactions as well. If a team of world-class experts cannot communicate well with each other while working together, their project will run into trouble regardless of how good each individual may be at their own part. Adults can learn to communicate better through music lessons. Musicians must often memorize pieces of music they plan to perform in concert, and memorization is a great mental exercise as it requires repetition and concentration. Attention to detail is an important aspect of learning a piece of music as well, since you must learn which notes to play, how long, how loudly, and so on. Concentration skills are also necessary, especially when playing with other musicians or in front of an audience. You must be able to focus on your own part in the middle of an orchestra or choir while still paying attention to the conductor and the performance of the group as a whole. This skill comes in handy throughout your life. Anytime you need to absorb important information or work in a place where other people are also working or talking. In a world today where everyone is distracted by their mobile devices, music lessons can help you with memory and concentration. Every job will present its own frustrations and obstacles, but those who have practical experience of perseverance will be ready for the challenge. Even for a person with natural talent, learning how to sing or play an instrument well 
requires a great deal of practice and repetition. You also gain valuable experience in how to face a new challenge every time you start learning a new piece of music. When a piece is difficult, you cannot give up. You play the hard parts repeatedly, going slowly at first until you hit every note right at the desired tempo. It's also beneficial to learn to recognize when you need help with something and how to ask for that help. Perseverance. The ability to accept change and go with the flow is a very attractive quality in an employee. Musicians learn how to play with new groups of people, how to play a different style of music, how to adjust to meet the requirements of a conductor, whether it's adapting to work with a different team, shifting to a new procedure, or learning how to use new software. Employees who can make a smooth transition will be much more successful than those who flounder when changes occur. Adaptability is something that I've been told by my previous boss that I was good at. He loved to spring music on me at the last minute. Sometimes my colleagues like to do the same thing. Here, C major, sight read this. By the way, you're performing it with me tomorrow. Say what? I can really relate to this skill, adaptability. The last soft skill is self-discipline and responsibility. Self-discipline is a crucial skill in any profession. Employers and clients naturally appreciate punctuality and time management skills because they are necessary. Necessary to plan one's schedule and complete work on time. Musicians must learn how to meet the goals of a lesson on schedule and make adequate time to practice. It also requires organization and personal responsibility. Because getting to a concert on time doesn't mean much if you haven't practiced adequately or forgot to bring your instrument, your sheet music, or other necessary items. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll continue in this last half with today's lesson one more time, talking about chords you already know. By the way, we are making changes over here at C Major before the show. We want to have the show serve as a gateway to music making for adults. We want to motivate you to learn how to write music down. I am not trying to teach you how to play the piano on a podcast or play a certain genre. I like to think of myself as an advocate for music literacy and writing things down. I really believe that if you take the time to write music down, you will see your music making dreams come true. So if you're at a piano and you look down at your hands, you should know where you are, what you're doing, where the music is going next and how to write what you're doing on paper so that you can communicate with others in a clear way. So I said writing it down on paper, but there are other ways to document your work. There is digital notation. Maybe you may decide to record using music software. You can use Logic. You can use GarageBand. You can use Finale. You can use other types of software that's out there. You can use a MIDI instrument. Whatever it is, just take the time to see structurally what you're doing. Take the time to see what the radical notes are. Take the time to see how your mind is organized when it comes to music. 
and take control of that. Really take control of that and own that for yourself. That's it. It really doesn't get any simpler or more complex than that here on this podcast. I'm so excited about today because we're changing the format of each episode going forward in a way that I can describe what I'm going to talk about. Talk about it. Talk about something else briefly that will drive home the point of getting into music making as an adult and then tell you what I talked about. Don't worry. We'll still do shout outs somewhere in the middle. But the most important thing I want to focus on is if you're out there doing work around the house, running, jogging, exercising, driving, commuting to work, listening just to have some background noise on, whatever the case may be, I'll be live with you week after week. I've been busy spelling out chords for you. In the past. Now I'm going to treat you even better this time because I feel like if you follow the podcast, you are now ready to talk in less baby terms. This is not a baby podcast. Find that A chord that we talked about. Find that E chord that we talked about. It's now time to make these and your other major chords minor. Think of this as your chord workout. You are getting stronger and stronger as you work on these chords yourself. For the colors, check out C Major Before the Show on Facebook. All of the chords are in my news feed over there. I'm sending you there because I want you to see it for yourself. Let's warm up by letter names only today. Give me a C chord. I'm going to spell it for you. It spells C E G. Give me an F major chord spelled F A C. Give me a G major chord spelled G B D. Next, give me a D chord spelled D F sharp A. Give me an E chord, spelled E, G sharp, B. Give me an A chord, spelled A, C sharp, E. These are all major chords that you know. Now it's time to make the minor by letter names. Here we go. Play a C minor chord. Letter names are C, E flat, G. Play an F minor chord. Letter names are F, A flat, C. Play a G minor chord. Letter names are G, B flat, D. Play a D minor chord. Letter names are D, F, A. Play an E minor chord. Letter names are E, G, B. Play an A minor chord. A, C, E. And let me say this to you with love and kindness. It's said as minor, like mine, or, and not minus, like Linus. By the way, I've posted some pictures with my hand model for you over at C Major Before the Show. Just look for our page on Facebook and you'll find it there. If you have any questions, feel free to send me a message. There are ways to contact me if you just take a look and feel free. 
Now we can form a drill. I want you to begin every day that you practice with going over these chords in this order. Prepare to spend five to six minutes a day on this drill. And please remember to go only as fast as you can. Listen to each chord. You can always challenge yourself by going faster. You may use any fingering that you wish. When I teach at the lesson studio, of course, I give my students guidance on hand positioning and fingering. Sometimes they follow it and sometimes they choose what is comfortable for them. You want to maintain control over your own playing and your own motion at all times. I would say try to play this drill six times if you can. That's my recommendation, but I'll leave it up to you to decide if you can play the drill six or seven times in a short practice period. And just to give you a heads up, in future episodes in September, what we'll start to do is have that third hour of homework. I'm going to spend the third hour helping you with your homework assignment. That means really breaking it down so that you don't miss anything. We'll talk about black and white key relationships. We'll talk about fingering. We'll talk about hand placement. I'll talk about the pictures that were posted just really giving you the baby steps. Not that you're a baby, but just giving you the baby steps in the homework assignment. The same way a tutor would do. Just fine-tooth combing everything so you don't miss anything. You feel totally comfortable. You feel totally confident. But for now, I'm just going to call out the drill and have you follow it with me. So here we go. Play it like you feel it. It's C, C minor, C. F, F minor, F. G, G minor, G. D, D minor, D. E, E minor, E. A, A minor, A. How did you do? Remember, try to repeat this drill six or seven times. This will become one way that you can warm up on triads at the piano. Now we're going to move into something that I've wanted to teach you for a while. We're in over our 30th episode here on Spreaker. And this is the longest episode today. And it will get a little longer. Once September rolls around, we are looking to keep you here for three hours. The third hour will be spent helping you with your homework assignment. That will start up in September. Let's move on now into the C major scale played as chords. This should be fun. You'll play them all as white keys. You may play them with both hands or with your right hand or with your left hand alone. I'll spell out each triad for you. C E G D F A E G B F A C G B D A C E B D F and C E G And I know some of you are wondering as you listen to this podcast, C major, why don't you just play the piano so we can hear you play it? Because I want you to play it. I don't want you to focus on my playing. That's what you do when you come to my show or my class. But it gets a little distracting. I've noticed that as I've watched teachers teaching online that sometimes people in the comments are paying attention to how the piano sounds if it doesn't sound good enough, things like that, how it looks. So I really want to just call it out and have you do it, have you try it, and then have you communicate with me on how it's going. Because it's no different than if you went to the store and you got one of those self-teaching books, and the book is telling you how to play everything. Unless there's a video link to the lesson, you're reading In this case, you're listening to me describe it, and then you'll try to see how you do it on your own and see if you're successful. And then if you need further help, then you can come to see a music teacher in person, and hopefully you'll come to see me. 
Remember the episode when we played blues chords? You learned that the three most important chords used in blues, jazz, and rock are built on the first, fourth, and fifth steps of the scale. By the way, on a personal note, I think I might have found a jazz teacher for myself. Yes, C major takes lessons too. I consider myself to be a student and a teacher, and I have great adult students who challenge me all the time to grow with them and to get better and to be more into the music that they're into and things of that nature. So it feels like a real exchange. And I would say that some of the best teachers are the ones that learn from their students, that it does feel like an exchange. I'm excited. I'm excited because this teacher that I ran into wants to learn from me. So she was trained at a conservatory for jazz, and then she wants to learn what I've learned about playing classical music. So I've said that my teachers were from Juilliard and Columbia, and they taught me everything that they learned. But I'm excited. I'm going to keep you posted. Chord symbols indicate a major chord unless otherwise noted. So if I call out C, F, G, that means to play a C major chord, F major chord, and G major chord. We'll talk more about blues in the future. For now, I want to give you a couple of progressions to practice. A chord progression is an organized series of changing chords. Watch out for the changes. Watch out for the changes. So here we go. Play it like you want to. A minor, A minor, G, G, F, F, E, E, A minor, A minor, G, G, F, E, A minor, A minor. How'd you do? Remember that I repeated this whole segment earlier in this episode. So if you were able to listen to what I did earlier and now you're listening to it again, hopefully you got it. Do you remember that we spoke about comping in an earlier episode? Keyboard players usually comp when accompanying or backing up a solo instrumentalist or singer. It's common for professionals to play the chord symbols using notated rhythms indicated with note heads or to improvise the rhythms notated with slashes. In the future, we'll talk more about Roman numerals so that I can say, hey, we're going to play a progression that uses 1, 6, 2, 5. And you'll know that I mean C major, A minor, D major, and G minor. Let me repeat that again. In the future, we'll talk more about Roman numerals so that you will know how to play a progression using 1, 6, 2, 5, and that I mean C major, A minor, D minor, and G major for the chord changes. We haven't talked about rhythmic notation yet, but if you want to know more about notation, join me over at the C major radio show. Here we go. Play it like you feel it. C, C. A minor, A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, E minor, E minor, A minor, A minor, G, G, C, C, A minor, A minor, D minor, D minor, G, G, C, C. A minor, A minor, D minor, G, C. How'd you do? Fine, I hope. I have so much respect for my musician friends who can just follow a chord progression like they know where the music is going. We're on a roll. Let's do one more progression. Try to play these chords with feeling and expression if you can. Here we go. 
Play it with feeling and expression. C, 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 C. C, 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 C. D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor. C, 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 C. F, F. E minor, E minor. D minor, D minor. E minor, E minor. F. F minor, E minor, E minor. D, D, G, G. C, 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 C. C, 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 C. D minor, D minor, D minor, D minor. C, 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 C. How did that one go for you? Hopefully it went well. Give me one moment. I'll be right back. So hopefully that went well for you. I'm so excited for you. We don't really have one textbook assigned to this podcast, but I want to read from a book that I currently use with my students. It's about triads and chords. It says, What distinguishes Western music more than anything else from other musical traditions is that it is made up of mixtures of simultaneous sounds of different pitch known as harmony. In comparison with other music, other music may have more complex rhythmic and melodic expression. I won't go into cultures that are mentioned here, but you can use your imagination. But I will say over the weekend, I did work with a family, and I was able to see from their culture that the music expression is very different. I have a musician friend that travels all over the world, and he talks about this. He travels to other continents, and he's always bringing back what he's learned. He's a real ethnomusicologist in this way. But we're talking about triads. So a triad consists of three notes. These three are the notes on which the triad is based, also known as the root plus the third and the fifth above it. As we have seen today in the case of the C major scale, triads can be built on each degree of the major and minor scales. They take their names from the degrees of the scales on which they are based. The triad on the tonic, or the keynote, is the tonic triad. The triad on the dominant is the dominant triad, and so on. As a shorthand device, they are also referred to by Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. For tonic, supertonic, median, etc. The triads on 1, 4, and 5 are known as the primary triads because the chords derived from them have a particular importance. Triads are classified as major, minor, augmented, or diminished. And so, as I was reading from this book, I skipped ahead because it talks more about triads. And it says, a triad is the simplest type of chord. The word chord itself does not have a very precise meaning. It could be defined as three or more notes sounded together. Three or more notes with a space between each note. But there is no limit to the number of notes in a chord. Just be practical. Think about the number of fingers that you can use to play the chords. Sometimes you can use one finger to play more than one note at a time. Over several centuries, Western music gradually evolved as an elaborate system. The system consisted of chords and their relationship to each other. And chords as we have seen, are especially popular in popular music. What's important about chords is the way that they lead to and away from each other. They are not isolated events. So if this topic is of interest to you and you'd like to get to know a little bit more about the language of chords, 
please feel free to contact me offline. I'd be happy to guide you to resources that talk about chords, that talk about chord notation and jazz, etc., figured bass, and chord layouts, just to name a few topics. So now, as we come to the end of this segment, I would like to offer you some practical tips. These tips come from the book entitled Learning a Musical Instrument. If you have begun to take some lessons on the piano or if you've been playing the piano and you've been playing the chords that we discussed, it's time to explore some ideas to help you maintain your good progress. It may at times feel like two steps forward and one step back, but that's to be expected. If you live in the greater New York City area, like I do, then you know there's music all around. There's so many opportunities to learn to play a musical instrument. I ran into an adult student over the weekend. He is studying a woodwind instrument for the first time as a senior adult. But he sounded a little down. I tried to cheer him up by reminding him that he was doing a good thing and that he is also multitasking. He's trying to master a number of new skills while balancing a job, a family. He's living in a busy area near the George Washington Bridge. And there he was complaining that his progress was slow. He said that his progress is slower than he wished it to be. I let him know that it's normal to feel this way, but he looks so defeated. I just reminded him that he is making progress and that he will start to see improvement over time. Another adult student came to me with a similar concern. She's doing great in her lessons, but she felt really bummed out because she wants to play music that she hears on YouTube by her favorite artist. Her teacher is a classically trained teacher, so the teacher doesn't always know the songs that the student wishes to learn. I just encouraged her to hang in there and reminded her that it takes time to see the progress you wish to see. The fact is this, that many adults look forward to practicing a musical instrument because they are doing what they dreamed of doing. They are playing the music they really want to play. And they know that practice is really the key to success. They have a sense of me time when they practice, especially after a hard day of work. Practicing can relieve tension that builds up after a hard day of work. You may feel that your practice time is repetitive. You may feel isolated. You shouldn't feel that way, but you may feel that way. You may feel that your practice is only concentrated on the difficult parts only. But just be encouraged. Try to find something fun in your practice. Just remember that practice is all about self-improvement. Just remember that you're trying to self-improve your playing over time is not going to happen all in one day finding the right time to practice can be a little tricky I once had a customer when I worked in music retail who showed me his roll up piano that he took to work with him he didn't have the most supportive family for his music making unfortunately for him His wife was totally against his idea to play a music instrument in the first place. She would bar him from purchasing instruments and he would have to sneak and buy equipment. He would just sneak and do it anyway. That's how much he loved to play. Practicing was what he loved and he found a way to help himself stay sharp by practicing at work during his breaks. If you do have family support at home, you may find time to practice in the mornings before you take off for work. That's a tough one, too. Anyone who lives in New York City knows that the commute to work 
is a hectic one. It doesn't matter where you live in New York, on the Upper West Side, on the Lower East Side, in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Long Island. It takes time to get to work. And you have to make a living in New York because it's all about money and it's all about work. But if you happen to be learning to play a musical instrument, as with any form of learning, little and often is usually best in these cases for practicing. Because even if it's for a few minutes at a time, you'll start to see progress over time. We posted a poll over at C Major before the show, and the question was, do you believe that practice makes perfect or practice makes better? The gaps between practicing give your brain and muscle memory time to assimilate and consolidate what you're learning, making that time in between practices all the more important. This aspect of learning away from the instrument mirrors what has been developed in sports training. The old adage, practice makes perfect, very easily becomes practice makes permanent, And if you do make something permanent, we need to be sure it's absolutely right. Now I'm going to say something that some people may not like, especially online teachers. Don't blame me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the messenger. But if you're taking weekly lessons, if you happen to be taking weekly lessons with your teacher... And the teachers in person. It can be said that this beats online learning and other forms of self teaching or self tuition. Because the idea is that an effective teacher can quickly put a simple error in posture, breathing, or hand movement, they can set it right and they can save so much wasted time later on. And I know this from experience. So what I'm going to recommend, just so I can stay friends with everyone, is to do both. I think we live in a time now where you can mix. I think the idea of online learning and learning to play the piano at home is a good idea. Because it gives you that me time that you're looking for. Rather than driving to somebody's studio or waiting for someone to come to you, you can just, with the click of a mouse... Go online and start learning instantly. So I think that's a good thing. I think that we all have to stay friends because we have the same goal in mind, and that is to see people learn to play the piano, something they've always wanted to learn, to see everyone study a musical instrument and really enjoy it and play the songs they wish to learn in addition to songs they want to feel challenged to learn. So I love doing this podcast. I want to stay doing this podcast. I want to stay helping my friends online. I want to stay friends with all the other teachers out there. And this author, although he has a point, I would just like to say that we can think of other ways to help our students online and offline. Teachers have a deep influence on the personal development of a student. So when you're studying the piano, this can be a valuable life skill. It can be a skill that helps you when you're trying to build confidence. It can be a skill for curious minds. A teacher can nurture that teacher can show you how to stay disciplined, how to stay patient. You can join an online community where everybody's encouraging each other on social media. It helps keep your self-esteem intact and you can share what you've been doing on your piano, on your keyboard. Teachers are 
sensitive to all of the little nuances, all of the dynamics, all of the articulation, and things that you may not even notice as a student. That's what a teacher does. So understanding how the process of learning relates to the end product and your work habits is what's key. Also your attitude and your character come into play. So I'll take a little time now to say something about the attitude that you want to try to have the best attitude that you can when it comes to learning. So I would just encourage you not to just give up and walk away in a huff or to just stay patient with yourself because it does take time and you can do it. Every piano teacher wants to engage the student with a sense of adventure and discovery. I believe that. I believe that every piano teacher wants to give purpose and direction in the lessons along with hard work, lots and lots of hard work. And if you discipline yourself, it can be very rewarding, especially when your attention is fully there and your senses are actively engaged. This blurring between work and fun is precisely intended as it leads to deeper learning. It leads to effective practice habits and it leads to a healthy work ethic at the piano, for instance. So one advantage of working in person with a teacher is that the teacher can intervene appropriately in real time when a skill starts to fail or your motivation starts to go down. But I bet if you contact your online teacher, they can help you too. It can be argued that teachers working via Skype and other online methods can do just the same. Because you really need to know how to do things correctly at all times. So sitting at the piano properly. I talk about this frequently with my students. I ask them, do you know how you're supposed to sit on the piano bench? I remind them to have a piano bench or a stool. Or if you don't have one, try to get one. I remind them to sit tall on the bench. You don't want to catch yourself slouching. I remind them if they're sitting a little too close to the keyboard that they can measure their distance at arm's length and use correct posture. I remind them to sit the appropriate distance. And I remind them to keep their arms level with the keyboard. You don't want your arms to be too high, your wrists to be in the air. And I remind them that sitting at the piano is not like sitting on your favorite chair at home. So if you're taking lessons online or at home, check with your instructor to make sure that you're not slouching or scrunching. When I went to a home for in-home piano lessons, they offered me what they thought was their best seat. And I'm sure they had good intentions, but they offered me a lounge seat. They offered me a lawn chair one for myself and one for the student, like the one you sit on at the beach. And I promise I'm not trying to be preachy here, but I think it's so important to have proper seating. And I think it's important for the teacher to demonstrate proper seating and to, and to explain proper posture. We'll talk more about that in our upcoming episode. I want you to join me next week for a new set of chords. And I want you to stay listening because in the future, we might offer you free practice chords. And I'm going to offer those practice chords on free practice cards. And in a future episode... I may even pray for someone who is having trouble in their piano lessons. Believe it or not, my students have asked me to pray for them when they know they're in trouble. So 
I may say a little prayer live right here on the podcast. I believe that prayer is a powerful thing, and I know that my students appreciate that someone is agreeing with them in prayer. Thank you so much for listening today. If I had a dime for every time I've heard someone say that they wish they had learned to play the piano or kept learning to play the piano, I'll let you fill in the blank. And the total keeps growing. I hear this wish almost on a daily basis from friends, from parents, siblings, strangers, and the list goes on. Last week, I wished out loud that I could play the piano like Aretha Franklin. I hope I didn't sound inappropriate by saying that on the air. It was said with good intentions and in honor to her musicianship. I have watched videos of so many musicians who are also piano players who have left us. One left us recently. I just read in the New York Times today. So my prayers and thoughts go out to the Walker family. I've listened to Horowitz. I've listened to Rubenstein. I've listened to Duke Ellington, I've listened to Count Basie, John Browning, and others. There are just too many to name. I have a list of about ten others who are still living that I also admire. C major before the show is aiming to reach you if you are an adult learning to play a musical instrument. If you're one of those who desire to play the piano, get yourself with a good teacher. Set aside some time to practice. If you started lessons but you didn't get very far in your school years, why not try it again? See if you can take your lessons further. My advice, get with a good teacher to teach you whatever style of music appeals to you. I'm an advocate for music literacy and building a library of piano songs. I'm even a fan of writing your own piano songs. You may be a beginner. You may be a novice. You may be an advanced beginner. You may be an intermediate student. You may live far away from a good teacher, one who has the right teaching style for you and the right studio. But get yourself to a lesson studio location that is right for you. Get into a lessons program run by well-educated teachers or a teacher that you think you can learn from. Find lessons that work for your schedule or, in some cases, request that a teacher can come to you. No matter your age, if you are 25 years old, if you're 52 years old, if you are a senior citizen, think about committing your time to music lessons. It only takes about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes of lessons a week. You decide when you're available and put a goal of literacy at the top of your list of things to do and watch your music-making dreams come true. I just want to say thank you so much for being with me today. I really enjoy being with you. And I hope you had some fun. I hope that you learned a little bit more about ways of seeing how to play the piano. And I don't claim to have a gift of communication. I really don't. I'll let you decide that for yourself. But I want to connect with you. I want you to give me a rating. Give me a rating. A comment on iTunes. Send me a tweet at C Major Porter 1. I'll be live again next week. Thank you for listening. Join C Major next week live for another episode of the Keyboard Situation Series, Playing by Chords and by Color, Part 6. Thank you again for joining me. This is C Major Porter. I'll see you next time right here on C Major Before the Show. Take care, be well, and make the best music you can make.